this is a uh, an office. This is, seems like a new location for you. It is a new location. I'm uh, uh, I'm in the Bahamas. I'm just in a uh, in an apartment here. So, can you leave the Bahamas? Like, why do you want to stay there? Like, why wouldn't like I feel like if I was in like a crisis like this, I'd want to be in my hometown or something. I'd like escape to New Jersey or something. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people would. <laughs> I guess, um, from my perspective, um, it's not about looking to to go home or something like that, um, uh, or or looking to you know be in uh, in sort of a a a you know escape hatch or, or something like that. Can yeah, you no, it's can you can you leave? I yeah, I, I presume I could, but. I, you know, this is where I've been running FTX from for the last year. And yeah, but it's all over. Where... There's no, there, you're, you're not involved. So you could, you know, out of your own volition, if you could leave, why, why not leave? Does like, isn't there a form of like a shadow that kind of hangs over you there? Oh, absolutely. There is, but, uh, but there still are, there's still things that need to get done. Um, you know, there's still a lot of global teams, you know, a lot of global regulators, administrators uh, who are, you know, working on and with FTX and the global teams there. And I want to be helpful as much as I can uh, to them to the extent that I'm asked. And OK, wait. Uh, I, so just before we really get into it, this is one of the probably one of the most um, n- uncontroversial topics, but one of the most confusing for me. Um, yep. If. Like when you say, just to set like a foundation to inform the conversation that you want to help with stuff and John Ray and team say that they don't communicate with you, that you're not involved. What is it like? What does helping mean? Like, what is that? Like, that doesn't make any sense. It's a good question. Um, And it's true that John Ray and his team do not communicate with me. They have not responded and he has not responded to a single message I, I've sent him. Uh, he has never talked with me, and you know his team does not, uh, in general, I uh, work with me or I uh, or I uh, you know care about what I have to say. Um, but his team isn't the only team that's working on FTX right now. Um, his team is working on some of the entities uh, from the United States. Um, especially from a U.S. perspective. My understanding is that that's what they've been focusing on. There are a lot of, you know, FTX international teams globally. Um, there are a lot of local regulars and administrators involved there um, who are Are these the ones working. that fall out? So that fall outside those four liquidation buckets? Because in terms of what John Ray's lined out, you've got FTX US, you've got Alameda. That all falls under his his sort of purview. Um, the only ones that don't are the ones that aren't part of the bankruptcy, right? So like Australia, um, Ledger X, for instance. So is there like what entities, let's, let's put it this way. Like what entities still are communicating with you? Uh, so I don't want to put words in, in other people's mouths and, and ultimately that's, you know, for other people to say, but. Uh, you can look at there. There are a number of entities that are not part of the Chapter Eleven proceedings, um, and there are also a number of places where, uh, you know, local teams, uh, local regulators, are uh, involved, and um, you know, whatever, um, where lo- local, you know, local regulators aren't going to stop caring about their citizens about their you know legal registrants about their entities about their employees um you know independent of whether uh an american team trying to to, normally tries to claim it trying to sort of work with bahamians it sounds like you're saying uh you know there's a bahamian team which uh you know has been appointed by the securities commission at the palmas um which is not part of the chapter 11 process um, there are other teams globally that are not part of the process or that have, I suspect, found themselves needing to work independently, uh, given, it. you know, uh, their need to sure. 
fulfill their own regulatory duties. Okay, well, let's dive right into it. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at at The Block, and I am back in the Big Apple, as it were, and on the other side of the mic is our guest, Sam Bankman, Freed, co-founder and former CEO of FTX, as well as the co-founder of uh, the now beleaguered uh, trading firm, maybe hedge fund, maybe family office, Alameda Research. Today we'll be examining the story behind FTX's collapse with Sam. Around this time last year, funny enough, you joined the show to tell us about the origin story of how you founded the firm. And today, of course, we we find ourselves in in very different uh, circumstances, also very much darker circumstances, like quite literally our lighting is like much darker. Um, But before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Huobi, one of the world's leading virtual asset exchanges, has been providing convenient and professional virtual asset management services to more than 50 million users in more than 160 countries for nearly a decade. At Huobi, their mission is to make crypto accessible, to help you understand risks and make informed decisions to protect you and your assets. Learn more today at Huobi.com. This episode is also brought to you by Ledin. From Bitcoin and USDC savings accounts to Bitcoin-backed loans, Ledin's financial services enable you to benefit from your holdings today without selling your Bitcoin. Learn more about Ledin at Ledin.io. Ledin, where your digital assets come to life. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblock.co slash terms dash service. Once again, on the other side of the mic, we have Sam Bankman fried Sam, if you could just um, indulge me for a second. I want to give a analysis of your sort of, you know, the, the, the PR blitz as it were that you've been making. And it's something that's almost part of the story, right? Um, so many events have unfolded around FTX and Alameda, but is it fair? And, and this is partially my own opinion. This is partially, um, I think the opinion of many other people's for folks paying attention that, it seems, and I want to get your side of this equation, that you're trying as hard as possible to distance yourself from Alameda. And it's clear that for those who maybe understand elements of the law, that the strategy that's being implemented implemented by you is to paint a picture of Alameda that is maybe fraud while you were just negligent, thus to attempt to avoid the most dramatic consequences for yourself. So let's, let's start there because it seems like the whole um, narrative you painted is woeful mismanagement versus criminal activity. So in, I guess a few sentences, I just want to get to that point. Do you think someone or the entity of Alameda itself did anything illegal? So the first thing that I'll say is I don't see myself as trying to paint a particular picture. I mean, it's just a question of, you know, trying to, as best I can, recall what happened and give, you know, a description of that. Um, but I, I, but it is true that I have not been very involved in Alameda for a while. Um, that I, you know, both because I had a full-time job with FTX at did not leave me time uh, to, you know, run Alameda. And also that because of concerns about a conflict of interest, um, I was very intentionally not um, uh, not very involved um, in, you know, in Alameda didn't want to be. Um, but, you know, to, to, to answer your question, I guess, um, I don't know exactly who knew what when. I don't, I don't, I don't want to put words in other people's mouths. And, I don't. Well, the um, words that the words that Caroline used right was that um, FTX uh, extended quite a bit of credit to Alameda yep. Research. She said that 
Um, you knew that Gary knew that multiple people within uh, both firms knew. Was she lying? Uh, I think she's so a lot of this is things that I've kind of tried to put together post hoc. I, I think she's likely correct that um, Alameda research was effectively extended a substantial amount of credit by FTX. And that, you know, in the end, uh, that that March position, um, I came under severe stress and, and effectively blew out um, and was not going to be margin callable. Um, I, in a way where, you know, Alameda would be able to, uh, to liquidate assets and, and, and effectively deliver, um, on the other side of it. So, uh, I do think that in effect that did happen and, uh, and I mean, really, really regret that having happened and it, you know, ultimately, ultimately, obviously a lot of people got hurt, um, a lot by it. Yeah. So um, when you last came on the show, right, I asked you a few questions yep. about the, um, about the origins of, of both firms, but FTX specifically. Yep. And there was, uh, the word I used was FUD about the eventual yep. launch of FTX. It seems like not only were the concerns of those individuals warranted, but they almost were were understated, right? Not only did FTX have some sort of, uh, rather did Alameda have some sort of special access to FTX, it literally, that special as access led to the downfall of both firms and had contagion effects across the market. So l let me ask you this, right? If you said to the FT, I think it was yesterday or this morning, but we, we, we uh, did a follow on the story this morning, that FTX did indeed, uh, or rather, sorry, Alameda did indeed have special access to FTX. Did investors and regulators, did Gary Gensler ever inquire about that special access? And did you tell them anything differently than you did to the FT? So uh, like it's hard. It's hard. Friends. It's hard for me to imagine that Sequoia did not ask if if Alameda had special access to FTX and you, and you said, yes, we do. And they would go on to invest. So, um, a bunch of points there. First one worth noting, um, is that this was, uh, none of this, uh, happened, I think with FTX us, FTX us, I think is still totally solvent always has been, um, did not have a liquidity crisis, um, didn't have a solvency crisis, uh, could get back everyone's, you know, funds tomorrow. I'm very confused why it's not, um, and very frustrated. Um, and, uh, and so one thing worth noting is that in the context of, you know, uh, of, uh, the U S business, um, uh, I think that, you know, it, it was basically not a margin trading platform. It was, a fully funded, um, okay, but maybe for the, uh, globe, maybe for the international business, did the Bahamian yeah. regulators ever ask about any sort of special access that Alameda had to FTX? So I don't know everything that, you know, I, 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 I don't remember having been asked, um, about that, but I'm not sure. Like, it seems like a dereliction I, of their duty for them not to ask. Well, I wasn't the only one corresponding with them. Um, but the other thing that I would say, and this gets to, I think, some of the other points and questions that, that you had made there, um, was, uh, and, and this certainly gets to a, at the very least, a dereliction of my duty, um, was that when you looked at, um, uh, at Alamy's, you know, access and footprint on FTX, um, I was thinking about that primarily in terms of uh, the trading perspective, in mm. terms of Alameda trading on FTX. Yeah. And yeah. that no, was no, a I, question I, that I, I got. I, I remember, and, and this is the point that you've made, you made it with Andrew Ross Sorkin. And in fact, yep. you even made it with me when I first asked about this question a year ago. You, as part of this separation between the two firms, tracked 
volume as a percent, uh, Alameda volume as a percentage of FTX volume. Yep. And that's right. You said it went down from 45% to, to 2% or something to that effect. But how could you not, and how could your investors and how could regulators not ask you about the sort of more margin risks that Alameda had exposure to FTX? And as someone who worked at Jane Street and who is literally someone who, you know, has over the past few years called out other market participants for not being above board, how could you ignore that mar- margin issue? Yeah. So, and, and like, uh, why didn't you have a CFO? You know, th- there's a long list of questions here. Right. To your point, And I don't all, the only answers I have are th- the honest answers to those questions, not always satisfying answers to them. Um, I, uh, but I, you know, to address some of those, um, maybe starting from the back, you know, well, how about like CFO? How about like a, fa- a financial team accounting, right? Um, we did have a financial team. In fact, we had gap audits done by, you know, independent auditors every year on FTX International. And I, those were accurate to my knowledge. Um, the, the problem You think there's there, a possibility that someone internally might have lied to the auditors? I don't, not to my knowledge. And the reason is that when you, well, at least when we were thinking about audits, about you know putting together FTX's financials, what that meant was putting together FTX's corporate financials, right? Putting together their revenue, their expenses, their balance sheet. Um, that was not looking at customer positions. That was not looking at customer risk. Um, and so, from the perspective of FTX's financials, um, I there was. Uh, not that much that interesting going on because, uh, you know, effectively this this was a large customer position that was on FTX rather than a um, uh, a large like FTX position or something with FTX's balance sheet directly. Now, obviously, I say that um, that's not true today, and that's not true today because today. Um, Alameda blew out. And that means, you know, that if FTX margin calls, you know, a user and they can't meet that margin call that, you know, FTX effectively assumes their liabilities. That begs begs the question, you as CEO of FTX, yes. why did you allow Alameda to have this special access? Right. And and I think now you're starting to get to the, the heart of it. And and I think this is one of the reasons that I don't particularly blame anyone else for this. You know, when you look at like, you know, our accounting and, and, and finances, um, uh, this was, they had an incredibly hard, you know, complicated job that within the scope of it, I think they did and did reasonably well. Um, I, and despite that, obviously, um, things did not end well. And that's because it was my job as CEO to make sure that no, but, but, all of the important but why jobs were getting done. So, and so, so let me ask you this. So yep. did, let me just very specifically, yes or no, did Alameda have a no liquidation account with FTX? Uh, I think this may have changed over time. I don't know the exact answer and as of when. Um, I think that it may have, had something like a delayed liquidation account near the end. I don't, I'm not entirely confident in that fact. Um, I was not Alameda's, I mean, really, and this speaks to part of the problem. No one was really then Alameda's who, core. Someone account. made that decision. Who made that decision? I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm not entirely sure how like those decisions um, became made. And on top of that, I mean, there are a number of things here that were extremely messy and that had um, very little oversight. And but you can confirm that there were different market makers, Alameda included, who had no liquidation accounts with the exchange. Um, I'm not confident um, 
if that is true or not. And I feel embarrassed to not be confident about whether that is true or not, because that is a thing that okay. I as CEO should be confident okay. about. Um, well, let's, let's, let's go back into sort of the idea of if, if let's, let's talk about um, just some of the granularities of like these licenses, right? That was another thing we talked about a year ago, how yep. one thing you were keen to do was expand the number of licenses. Yep. It is hard for me to imagine, right, that you, that the firms or FTX specifically went through these licenses uh, processes with these different regulators, and they didn't ask for disclosures, um, not just the regulators, but also the investors, right? Did they ever look at any of this stuff? I mean, did they, John Ray literally comes out and say there's zero financial controls and not a single global regulator in any of the countries you went to thought that was an issue? Or did someone well, I would, I would dispute the claim that there are zero financial controls. I completely agree that there were places in which there were very poor controls and that those places were critical and that that was really bad. Um, in terms of zero financial controls, I think it's pretty hard if you try and take over a company and refuse to talk with anyone who was involved in running that company um, to, in a short period of time, know where any of the relevant data um, would be or where any of the relevant policies or procedures would be or um, you know what books and records there were. There have been a lot of statements that have been made that have been put on legal record that I know to be false. Um, I, that I don't know if they were intentionally lying or if it was just um, an honest mistake because of people not consulting with anyone who knew where any of these records were. Um, but, you know, there have been cases where, you know, it's been said XYZ did not exist. And I am staring at a copy of XYZ and none of my emails have been returned. So I, okay. to that point, fair I actually enough, think enough. that was we don't want to just drag, mis nope. fairly misleading statements. Don't want but, to drag John Ray too much into it. In one of the interviews, I think it was with either, I think it was with uh, Andrew Wa Ross Sirk and you said, yep that you didn't knowingly or you were unaware of commingled funds between FTX and Alameda. I was with a former uh, employee of FTX and they said that, that they thought it was an open secret that the funds were commingled between betwixt the twain. Uh, you said on, you didn't knowingly, could you have, could funds have been commingled unknowingly by you? I'm not sure you mean, with the last two words there, could you have, could, um, you, could is there but, a possibility that funds between Alameda and FTX were coming yep. without your knowledge? So, I, uh, I'll give a few answers to that because can you say yes all, or no? Is it possible that they could have been commingled without your knowledge? Because you it said is unknowingly. Possible. Okay. It is possible that they could have been without my knowledge, although I don't believe that it is as simple as that question. Implies. No, it goes into the whole margin uh, scheme, right? Yeah. Using scheme in the British sense of the word, not in the American sense of the word, where yep. obviously uh, you, you had Alameda sort of blow up a large position, and that took out um, folks on the exchange. But what I don't understand is if FTX lent out. And, how could FTX lend out funds of clients in spot positions without their approval? Spot um, folks should be fine. Right. And, and so this gets to, and maybe just to expand a little bit on what you're saying to make sure that, that I understand it. What you're saying is there were people who had futures positions open, right? And whenever you have a futures position open, there's, in theory, a clawback risk. It's not a thing that I think we'd ever had before, but now we had a giant blowout. Um, for people who had spot margin, um, there is, in theory, a similar risk um, of but under spot should never be clawed back. Why would spot be right. clawed back? So, um, I so here, as best as I can piece it together, is my sense of the answer, and I don't feel entirely confident. 
about this answer that I'm going to give. Um, this is this is cobbled cobbled together between um, what I've been able what I was able to put together in the wake of what happened between vague recollections I had and other things. But my best guess at the answer to that is the following: that there were a few different things that each contributed. So one thing, as you uh, hinted at, was spot margin trading, um, right? Was borrows and loans through that. One thing was open futures positions that were not able to be effectively closed down um, without losses. Um, those two reach in the billions. Um, uh, on top of each of those two things, um, there are, I think, two other effects that happened, um, which I think speak to what I think the question you're asking is. Um, one of them, the, the, the question is, is, the question is why were folks in spot positions ever, right. why were, okay, we can make it a simple yes or no. Again, did FTX loan out anyone who had a spot position? Did they lend that out to Alameda? It seems like so, that was the case, but the question is why? Right. So here, here's my best guess about Let's say I'm Frank Chaparro. Yeah. I have my derivatives position. Yep. I do not allow margin and benefit right. no way from margin. Why is my crypto being lent out to Alameda? So um, here is my best guess at the answer to that. Um, first of all, uh, historical fiat transfers. So this was, if you... Scroll back to 2019, 2020, FTX did not have its own bank accounts. Um, it didn't have its own bank accounts because it was hard to get bank accounts as an international cryptocurrency exchange. And we we were trying, we eventually succeeded. We, you know, it's, it was a global business. We needed sort of separate banking in a lot of jurisdictions, but over the course of, you know, primarily I would say of 2021 or so, we put together that, that you know, banking suite. Um, and uh, we didn't have that at the beginning. And that meant that, you know, some clients who wanted to wire money to FTX nonetheless, um, especially clients who had a pre-existing trading relationship uh, with Alameda, um, would uh, wire money to Alameda's bank account. And uh, they would do this because that was the only way that they could, you know, wire money and then trade on, on FTX at the time. Um, what, you know, that flow I think looked like was basically Bob wires a hundred dollars to Al straight to Alameda research. And then Alameda effectively ledger transfers a hundred dollars to Bob on FTX. Um, and when I say Alameda transfers, I, I don't mean to imply who is taking the action to make that transfer. I don't know the technological details of the system. Um, and I, I'm not confident that what I'm about to say is correct, um, but it is my you know, best guess um, putting together what, what I can, which is that, um, that, that, that that set of transfers resulted over time in a significant amount of dollars being sent from customers straight to Alameda Research, never hitting FTX in the first place. Um, and, you know, the, um, uh, I, I think one responsible way of doing that, uh, or at least, you know, one reasonably responsible way of doing that, in, in my sort of opinion, uh, not extremely carefully thought out, would have been to have, um, I, you know, I, those be, you know, that this would only work if Alameda could effectively be debited from their primary account on FTX. And so then Alameda would effectively need to have had balances to transfer to those users. Um, uh, and that that was sort of, you know, built into Alameda's margin and, and uh, you know, and, 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 and borrow on, on FTX. Um, I don't believe that's what happened. Um, my, my sense of what happened now um, I, my, my best guess is that rather, um, I, here's a question that one could ask. A question one could ask is, 
did this result in Alameda taking a borrow on the USD borrow lending book, right? When that wire transfer came into Alameda and then Alameda was debited on FTX and Bob was credited, did that debit from Alameda result in an increase in US dollar borrow open interest? I'm not sure that it did. Um, and uh, it was, among other things, I don't believe that that was coming from Alameda's primary account on FTX. I believe it was coming from a stub account um, that was specifically meant um, to be a ledger for wire transfers okay. um, that customers well, had sent. How did auditors not catch this? Because, and because basically, um, at least from some views, this wasn't a part of FTX's financials, right? F this was, from some view, um, FTX's financials, th this was effectively a customer um, negative position. And, you know, many, many customers had negative positions open on FTX. Um, I, that was, it was a margin trading exchange. That's sort of how it had worked. Um, and uh, this, you know, those were not part of FTX's assets or liabilities. So were customer assets and, and liabilities. And so FTX's financials were not directly impacted by this. Now, obviously, you know, saying this now, um, FTX was impacted by this. Like Got there, it. there Got was it. significant were, risk were there associated. Any, with were there it. any market making firms outside of Alameda that had this special access? That had which? The the no liquidation, or as you put it, delayed liquidation. I think so, but I'm not confident. And I remember hearing chatter about about that, about you know a few, but I I don't I I honestly so don't here, know okay, where those so, discussions ended. Okay, I have two questions, and I don't want to. There's a bunch to get into, but I just want to yep. double click on sort of the the relationship between the two. Yep. Um, historically, you have been a bit um, elusive on the, um, you know, in hindsight, you say that you have no involvement in Alameda. When we talked to you in 2019 about the conflicts between Alameda and FTX, you said you'd imminently step down as CEO. It took two and a half years for you to do so. Um, so, it, and that juxtaposed it's sort of everyone kind of, um, you know, operating very closely seems surprising that you'd have zero visibility, especially given that Caroline said that you, you knew. So we'll obviously, you know, get her side of the story at some point, but I want to just really like zoom in on this, this idea of special access, because you said to the FT this week that Alameda had special access. When you were speaking to, um, you know, when you're in Washington and you're speaking with Gensler, you're speaking with members of the CFTC, you're speaking with policymakers, did they ever ask you yes or no if Alameda had special access to FTX? Did any of them ever ask you? So when you say that, you know, you're stating there that uh, Alameda had special access. Um, no, no, no. Did... Did F did any right. policymaker, any regulator in Washington ever inquire just generally about the relationship between FTX and Alameda? So there were lots of inquiries about the relationship between FTX US and Alameda. So they didn't um, care about the relationship between FTX International and Alameda Research. There were ways in which it was relevant. And, and what were those ways? So one of those ways was, f and look, this was, I mean, as I say this, obviously, it was extremely relevant in many ways from the world's perspective and should have been from my perspective. And I'm not at all trying to justify. Um, no one thinks you're trying being, to justify. I'm, I'm but, asking a very simple question. Yeah. Did they ever ask? And what was your response? So... Let me, let me, let me put myself in the yeah. shoes of regular. I ask you, does, let's say six months ago, which I'm sure you were asked, does Alameda have special access to FTX 
any of its subsidiaries. And you say, well, when you say it's subsidiaries, um, like the, the international and the U.S. businesses, not it's a little bit of a technical point, but neither were subsidiaries of the other units um, or, or they what, whatever were word sister you would use. entities. Right. So uh, I think what I'd say would because be when I asked you, you just you just sidestepped the question. You didn't really respond to it. So I imagine is that was that the strategy sort of it was kind of ambiguous. It was confusing. So. I'm not sure I'm correctly remembering everything I've been asked, but what I can tell you I do remember being asked about was trading patterns. Like what I do remember being asked about was from the perspective of market manipulation, from the perspective of uh, order book liquidity, from the perspective of revenue. But not from um, the perspective of credit. Okay. Let's, let's, to let's, my knowledge, we yeah. Got, yeah. Well, that's really unfortunate, right? That's the big issue here. Um, yep. okay. So you've stated that you got a hundred thousand dollars in your bank account. So how are, are you paying any law firms? Who is your, how are you I'm paying trying, for stuff like that? And, and how are you paying for rent? Are you still in the penthouse? I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to pay for things. And, um, there but are complications there. Well, how, what are your living expenses? Are you still in the penthouse? So, and for safety reasons, I can't say exactly what building I'm in because there are a lot of uh, paparazzis and, and others who've Fair been. Enough. There's uh, but... yes, Gabriel. Um, but are you, <laughs> yep. so, okay, but... very specifically, um, yep. do you have access or are the, are those um, buildings in the Bahamas still owned by you or by FTX? So I never owned very much property. Um, a lot of like the numbers that you see floating around are generally the sum total of what, you know, all of the, you know, roughly, I think a hundred employees put together plus, um, you know, the company owned, um, in, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Bahamas and, you know, putting all of those together, you get a, uh, you know, fairly significant amount, but do you uh, think but, that that's sort of like counter to the Toyota Corolla? narrative that was um espoused that i mean that em employees owning property or me personally well they because... were bought at least what was reported is that they were bought by the firm in the name of employees i uh, you know we did and i'll be pretty like we did spend a fair bit on employees um we were trying to attract, you know, top Silicon Valley talent. And, you know, we were trying to get them to move generally to move countries to work for FTX. Um, you know, we paid, we compensated fairly highly for employees. And, you know, we put a lot of work into trying to make it a comfortable life for them and Got to it. make it easy for them to have a comfortable life. Um, um, so one thing that um, might have made someone's life quite a bit more comfortable was a $55 million loan that was extended to Ryan Salem. Why do you think that was appropriate? I honestly don't know the details of that, and it's I don't the, have it's access in the, to it's that in information. The, it's, it's in the bankruptcy filing in black and white. I, I, I've, I've seen in the filing that- $5 million dollar loan. Did, so that was extended by the firm. Who Did you not sign off on that? Can you say that on the record? Sorry, when you say by the firm, by- um, I would- and, 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 and to be clear, I'm- like, yeah, I, I am trying to piece this better together as best I can. I don't think FTX did. Um, is is that correct? I'd be pretty surprised if FTX had. No, of course not. It was like Bahama but, LTD International something or other. Right. I, I suspect that Alameda may we have. We can look it up. Um, let me get um, yep. somebody on it. Um, um, but, 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 but anyway, so I, uh, I don't. I honestly don't know what's going on with individual, um, you know, lines of credit, and and I don't want to put words in other people's mouths. To to the extent that I do know, um, what was going on with any of them, um, I I don't believe that most of them were used for personal consumption. I don't know of them, you know, being used for personal. Okay, well, there's no, there's no, there's no, but... there's no. It's it's fact that he got a fifty five million dollar loan. So mm -hmm. if if not for personal consumption, then for what? 
I honestly am not sure. Okay, well, one loan that we do know the trail of is uh, a loan that was made uh, from BlockFi clients to Alameda and then extended to a shell company that you owned, which you then used to purchase shares in Robinhood. Why was that appropriate? I don't think that was the, well, to my knowledge, and and obviously what, there what have oh, been- Okay, a, okay, fine. So what money did you use to purchase those shares in Robinhood? So the first thing I'll say is like dollar bills are, are generally fungible, which is to say that um, I, what, what I can give you the answer to is how I was thinking about where that money was coming from. And um, the, uh, and the answer there is basically um, I, that I, basically from, you know, trading profits from Alameda Research. Alameda had, uh, you know, something like, I, I think a few billion dollars of trading profits over uh, the last few years between, you know, staking, trading, um, uh, you know, arbitrage. Um, and uh, that's what I had thought of it as coming out of. But that's just not true. I mean, according I, to the, what's not true. Let, just in general, like according to the paperwork filed with the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the District yeah. of Delaware, Alameda Research had $4.1 billion in related party loans, $1 billion to Bankman Freed, $543 million to Nishad Sin, and mm -hmm. $55 million to Ryan Salem. Okay. So what wasn't what, true? What explains that? Why is this appropriate when there's no financial controls, where there's no sort of idea of where the money's coming from? I've never, I, need, well, I mean, I understand that you want to keep talent, but is, is keeping talent worth lending someone $543 million or $55 million? So um, a few things. First of all, I, I think you said that something wasn't true, and I'm not sure what you were saying wasn't true. Um, but so the part that wasn't true is, I mean, it is, it is true that Alameda borrowed from BlockFi for, and then lent the same amount to your shell company to buy those shares in Robinhood. It didn't I think come, those didn't, didn't come in that order, it didn't come, did they? It didn't come from profits of Alameda. Are you sure that's the order that those came in? Like, to my knowledge, and, and I, I could be wrong about this, like, one thing that's become clear is I was embarrassingly wrong about a lot of things, but to my knowledge, um, I, the, uh, I, I think the BlockFi loan that you're talking about, I had thought of as being fairly recent. Um, and I think more recent than the other loans that you're talking about, which, um, I think that the, uh, I think the most, that most of those other loans were for, reinvestments in in the business that were i think made you know i, I want to say a year or two ago well, why and would, so why, why would a company lend 550 or 543 million dollars to an individual in the company to reinvest in the company so you're saying the shot got that money to reinvest in the company so um i to i i well to reinvest in a company and in particular, I why, think that why, like what 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 company would Nishad be reinvesting in with a half a billion dollars? So I can't speak to Nishad, but what I can say is that um I that I think that like from my perspective, um there were you know investments, you know, see investments in FTX US um was one piece of this. Um there were um I you know maybe some some venture investments. I'm not uh I, I don't have access to this data right now. So I, I'm sort of trying to speak from, from memory and from sort of, uh, backtracing what I think, you know, likely happened, but, um, I, but there are a lot of cases where, um, it didn't make sense where it wasn't for one reason or another, right. For, uh, Alameda to invest, um, where in something. And, uh, and so in those cases, I, you know, I would sometimes invest in it. Um, another piece of, um, yeah, you're sorry. I, 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 that, that is, is my basic sense of the answer there.
I just don't understand why, if you wanted to reinvest in something, why would you have to loan it to an individual? Why couldn't you just reinvest it with the profits or the, the capital on the balance sheet? I think there are cases where, uh, for one reason or another, it was deemed that it would not be as appropriate for Alameda Research to be an investor in something. And I think that one example of this was, you know, not wanting Alameda Research to be a large investor in FTX um, for conflict of interest reasons. Um, obviously, that feels embarrassing to say now in retrospect, given what happened. Um, but I think that was one example of it. The days, um, the, the short few days while the entire meltdown happened, there were quite a number of inconsistencies. Um, you went out in a tweet that has now been deleted and said that um, everything was okay, um, that folks didn't really need to worry about um, their funds. But then in the interview with Andrew Ross Sorkin, you said that over the course of November 6th, November 7th, November 8th, you were digging into all of these issues and you saw smoke and, and possibly a fire. So then why did you say that everything was okay uh, just a few short days later? I mean, that literally, you know, I mean, you, 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 when was your, that? your team forced Jump and other entities to go out and say that everything was okay, which kept more folks on FTX. I, uh, the timing of those that that's not how I remember the relative timing of those. Um, when was that tweet sent exactly? The, um, deleted tweet. It was sent yeah. on the 10th. Sent on the, so let's check out uh, my notes uh, here. Uh, your, no, your deleted tweet was on the seventh. Yeah. But then you said yeah. on that, on the sixth that you noticed that something was seriously wrong. On the 6th, I noticed that there was a large potential problem. It was over the course of those few days that I became convinced that it was not just a theoretical problem, but that it was likely to be a, a potentially existential one. And I think by, like, I was pretty surprised when you said that it was on the 10th that I sent that tweet, I would not no, have it thought on, that lined up with it once. And it, given nope, on the 7th, seven, right. And these things unfolded so, so quickly that there was a very large difference between, for instance, you know, where my head was at on, you know, the beginning of the 7th versus the end of the 8th. So you were, tweeted that not really knowing anything. You tweeted that it was safe without really knowing anything that was going on. I tweeted it with, um, a, I think, outlook on things that I, within a day or so, began to feel was not realistic. And I don't remember exactly when I remembered, you know, thought about that tweet and deleted it, but I think it was not that long after for that reason, which is that, um, I, that it was, I, I mean, that it did not reflect where my head was at shortly thereafter. And I don't feel great about that tweet. It was, you know, when I had sent it, I was trying to figure out what I could say that was, um, that I thought was true. Um, and, uh, I, uh, I vetoed a lot of versions of it that I thought were not true, um, that, you know, people were encouraging me to send, um, and pared it down quite a bit. Um, but even given that by, I mean, I think, frankly, I don't remember exactly when, but I think probably even by like eight hours after that was not, uh, that, that tweet didn't really reflect where my head was at very much. How do you, how do you feel emotionally and mentally right now? I, uh, and over the past six months, because there's been a lot of allegations about potential abuse of drugs, about potential stress about potential sort of um, being a bit out of lockstep with reality? So, I mean, I don't feel good right now. Um, and I, I don't, I mean, I'm, 
it doesn't feel good right now when I reflect on what's happened on the impact that I've had, like that does not feel good. And I don't, I don't think it's, I mean, I think that is what it is. I don't, I don't think there's any like, uh, right particularly for me to feel good about it. Um, I, uh, it sucks. Do you, do you think that, what um, happened? do you think that it, how do you think in terms of retrib- retribution, um, will you, do you believe that you deserve to be punished in some way? It's not my decision to make. And, and when I'm about to say, I say, no, no, I, I, don't, I, think 20- I don't even mean like criminally or legally. I mean, just like, right. like, do you believe you deserve to be punished in some form? So I can h- tell you how I think about it, but I don't, I don't want to put words in anyone else's mouth there or, or say anything about how they should think about it, but how I think about it. Um, I, I think I have a duty. I think I have the strongest duty I have ever had to anything. Um, just yes to or do no. everything. Do you, I, do you believe you deserve to be punished? I think about it in terms of having a duty to do what's right and, and a duty to do, you do that everything that I can who, make do you up deserve, for. Do, do you believe that anyone who has hurt someone should be punished? Like, just like ethically, morally, like, forget about the whole SBF, FTX thing. Like, do you think an yeah. individual who hurt someone deserves in some form, not legally, not, you know, morally, do you think they deserve to be punished? I think my honest answer to it is the thing I feel strongly is that they deserve to have a duty to make it right, no matter what it costs them as best they can. Like that is the answer that feels real to me. And that's the answer that, um, I, you know, that, that, that's what, what, that, inf- yeah. what informs that sort of, uh, thinking. Is there a is there a philosophy or a, a a thinker that informs your your sort of karmic view that you know this is very antithetical to you know an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth yeah um, what informs that so I mean at the end of the day like I'm it sounds like you think consequent. no one should ever be punished I don't think that I think that it is important to have punishment it is important to have incentives um and 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 negative incentives um i but i but i also think that that doesn't make it up to people that doesn't fix what happened and that doesn't i that doesn't undo it um that doesn't you know that that doesn't make it right by people um i think the only thing that can make it right by people is something that i that you know, that actually counteracts some of what happened, that actually undoes some of what happened. And uh, that that's what I think matters. That's what I think matters most. Fair enough. I'll, spare, that, I'll yeah. spare you of uh, some of these more lofty philosophical questions and maybe uh, unpack something a bit more newsy or something I'm sure that's top of mind for you. Um, bankruptcy i'm sure this is your you know this is your first rendezvous with this whole process um you've said uh on a number of occasions that you would have preferred to have avoided it um at least with ftx us if i believe um yeah or but probably maybe for the whole uh uh, whole totality of the entities um would you prefer the bahamas take over this process um I what I think is that whoever is running various parts of the process, what I think is important is that they're keeping customers front and center, that it is all done to maximize value to customers. So it's all done to maximize how much at the end of the day creditors get back here. And um, when you look at FTX US, as you said, I think that should be returning people's funds tomorrow. I think that that's a solvent entity to my knowledge. And um, and I think that 
you can see on Twitter a lot of problems that people have been having, you know, with, you know, withdrawals that just didn't ever land, you know, coming from the last days as well. Um, and so from US, I think that's what should happen. And I don't think it needs a uh, insolvency proceedings. I don't think it's insolvent um, I, a, a, at all. Um, when you look at internationally, um, you know, what I would say is that um, uh, I think that there are a lot of players that are running it right now. There are a lot of players that are involved in various aspects globally. Um, I would like all of those to be focused on maximizing value to customers. And I, I think that that would mean cooperating internationally. I think that that would mean promptly fulfilling, you know, uh, all of the you know needs that various entities, jurisdictions, regulators, administrators have, uh, making sure that you know each region is able to look after their customers, um, and you know actively, um, I you know looking at what the plans are that could provide you know the most value to customers. You know what would ultimately maximize the amount of funds available to customers here. Um, I would be surprised if the answer to that was salting the earth and burning everything to the ground. I think that seems very likely, you know, I would think that would be very likely to be minimizing the amount of value to customers. I think that would minimize the value of the remaining assets. And I think that that would minimize, you know, the value of uh, the business, which, you know, could be used to, um, you know, bring more value to customers. And so I, you know, one answer is, I think whoever is running this process in, in, in principle, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't care so much who is running the process as what they're doing with it. Um, but I also think that, you know, I, that, it, that it's really important that all the, you know, key stakeholders here, all of the key regulators, uh, the administrators, the jurisdictions, um, you know, who are running the international business, uh, globally are, uh, front and center and that there are, you know, that their role in this is, is, you know, is respected. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I think that that means, you know, the, the, the people who had been playing a large role, um, in, you know, uh, in the business and, and its users, um, playing a large role, you know, the, 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 the places that is the jurisdictions, the regulators, the administrators, um, you know, playing a large, large role right now in, in doing right by them. Um, I think that would be appropriate. Um, and I can't speak confidently to what I, you know, what each of the teams will ultimately do. Some of them aren't telling me what they would do and that's okay. They have no requirement to do so. Um, but I, you know, I, I would have thought that I would see more actions in the direction of returning assets to users and trying to generate value. Um, for users coming out of the process, then at least I've been, you know, able to, to, to witness from the outside as of now. And that's been, uh, I hope there's just a lot that I'm missing. Um, uh, there's that would be there's, great. There's a lot, there's a lot missing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not to harp on the block by thing. I just thought it was like one of the most shocking, um, revelations. And I know you've said that you, you don't recall that, that it was, you know, from a loan, um, you thought the money was from trading profits in terms of any money you've cashed out. Um, have you filed taxes? Have you, um, you know, in terms of like your situation with the IRS, could that be an issue? Yep. I mean, I've, I've been filing taxes. I don't, um, uh, I don't think I have many assets. I don't, I didn't cash out a billion dollars here. I don't have a bill. I mean, unless you still think my equity stake in these businesses is worth a lot. Like I was funneling basically everything I had into that. I've got, um, I, you know, I've got a bank account, which I'm still trying to figure out how to log into because I've been, uh, not granted access to my personal passwords. Um, so I'm going through a very long password reset. Um, I, I, you know, process, um, but I, uh, you know, to my knowledge had something like a hundred thousand dollars in it. Um, uh, I, um, not Sam one, two, three, four exclamation point. I've tried it, but it may have been a five was the problem. And I can't remember. So, yeah. 
Um, but no, I didn't. I wasn't cashing out from this. I, I never was. Um, so you, and you, you've never cashed out from FTX or Alameda. Any US? I, there was a Wall Street Journal article that suggested that you took three hundred million from the most recent fundraise for your own personal. Um, that was not that. from the most recent fundraise. That was from one of the prior fundraises in twenty in I think mid twenty twenty one. And what that was doing, that was reselling a small fraction of the uh, uh, of the equity that had been repurchased from Binance. Um, but it, it was still a large net repurchase. So you know, between those transactions, um, uh, did investors I know think you it, were going to do that? Do what? Repurchase those shares with that money. With uh, the repurchase came first. Got it. Were investors privy to you? taking that money out taking the, you mean the reselling piece mm -hmm. um i don't so first of all i think that went to alameda research i don't think that went to me personally okay uh, to enough. my but knowledge did, so when ftx raised 420 million dollars yep a long list of you know storied investors yep yep, yep. did investors know that 300 million dollars of that went to you or not. I well it didn't it didn't go to me personally. It went to Alameda, and it was a small fraction of the amount it went that to Alameda. Yep, and yeah. it was a small fraction of the amount that Alameda had just spent buying Binance out. But also, I I believe that we did inform investors that that was what uh, we were intending to happen. I don't remember the details of that. It was a while ago, um, but we weren't trying to hide anything from investors there. Um, uh, that was, and we we hadn't been planning to do that until near the end when it eventually became clear that um, it was going to be really important for the business that we do that. And, you know, when that became clear, um, uh, we did what, you know, it felt to me like we had to do it, and can you bought paint Binance a, out can you, there. Can you paint a picture for me? Like what you, you mentioned that you did have some controls in place. Um, John Ray is not um, a hundred percent accurate in your view. So what, what people were involved with the firm's financials? What, what, who were on, who were the folks on that team? Well, so when you look at the firm's financials and, and there again, the way that we thought about, we were thinking of FTX's corporate financials, not about risk measures on client accounts. Um, you know, there were, I mean, we had an accounting team, a finance team that was involved. We had obviously external accountants. Um, you know, some developers were involved in pulling data for that. I was sort of like high level involved. Um, I I would like read through fine, you know, the okay, you know, so FTC's who, who financials. Was, where did the buck stop? What what person? Aside on the you. corporate, on the corporate financials. On the corporate financials. Yeah. Um. I I would say like, I it was obviously partially me, but outside of that, um, I you know partially obviously with uh with external auditors, um, and outside of that, um. You know, there are a few people I uh, who were sort of leading the finance team. You can't think of you know, a name. Who's... You can't. You don't know who led the finance. Team. Uh, I, I sorry, I do know some names. I I feel nervous saying it just because it's not my. I uh, I haven't talked with them, gotten permission for them to talk about their role here. Um, but I I I can reach out to them and see if they're comfortable with that. Um, there is sort of one person, you know, internationally. There's one person in the U.S. who were um uh sort of chiefly involved in putting together uh. I, uh, you know, interfacing with the auditors and effectively and, and helping to put together uh, FTX's, uh, you know, audit financials each year. Okay, got it. Wobi, one of the world's leading virtual asset exchanges, has been providing convenient and professional virtual asset services to more than 50 million users in more than 160 countries for nearly a decade. At Wobi, their mission is to make crypto accessible, building the go-to hub for the next billion crypto users. Wobi believes crypto shouldn't have any barriers to entry. Wobi is committed to asset and platform security to help you understand risks and make informed decisions to protect you and your assets. Learn more today at Wobi.com. I also want to give a shout out to Ledin. 
Let in Bitcoin backed loans and savings by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. As we've seen, not all digital asset lenders are created equal. Let in prioritizes safeguarding clients' assets with its robust risk management approach. That is why Ledin doesn't actively trade or invest in DeFi yield generation strategies with its clients' assets and only supports Bitcoin and USDC, two of the highest quality and most liquid assets in the industry. Ledin is also dedicated to transparency, which is why they are the first digital asset lending company to complete a proof of reserves attestation. Learn more about Ledin at ledin.io. Ledin, where your digital assets come to life. I also want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Athletic Greens, recommended by professional athletes with one delicious scoop of AG1. You're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. It helps me start my day. I mean, I'm on the road a lot reporting on a 24 hour market. So I need some sort of boost to keep me energized throughout the day. Who knows when a story is going to drop on my desk. Anyway, tons of people take multivitamin supplements, and I've realized it's important to choose one with high-quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. As someone who's tried a bunch of different multivitamins and has still felt tired and run down, Athletic Greens has made a huge difference for me. But anyway, to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash scoop. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash scoop to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Thinking about like just the future of crypto capital markets, because this is something that we've talked about a lot. Um, yep. Historically, this is this is like one of the key questions or topics that we've explored. Um, personally, I think like the entire market needs to revisit the way collateral works. Yep. Is it pretty insane or, or you know, to put it less dramatically, did you ever second guess the decision to use low float coins? as legitimate collateral for loans. Why did you think that that was appropriate? So I did second guess it sometimes. Um, I really wish that I had second guessed it a whole lot harder than I did. Um, the context in which that came up the most was, you know, periodically there were people who would try to exploit um, FTX and who would basically, um, you know, take some, uh, you know, relatively illiquid coin that, you know, was allowed for spot margin on the platform. And um, I, you know, accumulate a large position in it, um, you know, often trying to manipulate the market in it. Um, and then you know, withdraw a bunch of dollars and try and leave FTX with a loss. And there is a little bit of a game of cat and mouse um, that was played uh, with them. There is back and forth that we had about that. And, you know, we like would sometimes remove coins from being eligible for spot margin because of that, because that was just getting abused too much. Um, I, and, uh, um, and so it was, it was a constant, uh, sort of concern that, 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 that we had. Um, but, you know, the way I remember thinking about it was not as generally an existential concern, not as a, um, you know, do or die concern for the exchange. It was something where, you know, I don't know, maybe we lose a few percent of our revenue or something to that each year. Um, and I, you know, a lot of people really liked being able to have a lot of flexibility in how they used it. Um, obviously, that that was how I was thinking about it at the time. Obviously, in retrospect, um, I, I was not thinking well about what the what the tail cases were here. I was not thinking well about what this would look like in I you know, in situations where it got a whole lot larger. And I, I, I think it's, it's a non-trivial problem. And I think that like, you know, there should have been a lot more controls and, and uh, you know, both in terms of, I mean, on, on many levels, like in terms of like site-wide amount of coin, you know, some coin that could be used as collateral in terms of, um, you know, site-wide haircuts in terms of uh, thinking about stress test scenarios and, uh, you know, I think, you know, maybe even looking at like site wide, um, you know, balances held of something um, as part of like stress test 
um, for, um, you know, collateral for assets, um, having a lot more transparency on that, you know, I, I think like just having, you know, publicly displayed, um, the total amount of, you know, assets that are being used as collateral. Um, there are a lot of things there that I think at least could have helped, you know, increase transparency, both externally and internally there quite a bit. And outside of that, I think like, um, I, you know, was it even worth it having some of those coins available at, at all as collateral? I mean, in retrospect, no, certainly. Got um, it. in retrospect, you, like we should have probably mm -hmm. just had a thinner list to begin with. So one other topic that I'd be remiss not to bring up in addition to collateral, um, another market structure topic is just the potential conflicts of interest that can arise between a trading firm and an exchange being owned by the same individual. Yep. Um, is, is this question of the back door and Reuters reported it. Uh, we were able to independently confirm it from someone who was an employee of Alameda who said that this back door existed for at least since he joined the company. Uh, you've been asked about this and said that you can't code. You don't know how to code. You couldn't build a back door. Is it possible? Yes or no, that Gary Wang could have built a back door for Alameda to tap into FTX deposits. So I'm not sure exactly what people are referring to when they talk about the back door. Is it, um, if you could give me more color on specifically what that, you, that's referring to. Do you think it's it? possible that Gary could have built some sort of system by which FTX, every time it got a deposit, let's say uh, Sam deposits $10, Alameda could then in turn borrow ten dollars from ftx um is it anything's possible i think like you know i was i was under the impression that alameda was over collateralized at the very least on ftx um and and so I'm not sure whether in your scenario you're building that in or not, or you know whether or not you're assuming that that is still true, or whether you're you're assuming that that gets effectively violated as well as part of this. Um, but you know anything is is possible there, um, and uh, uh, I don't think that there was like intentionality to have um, a, you know an infinitely big position there or anything, but. It was the case that, um, at least early on in FTX's you know life cycle, uh, back in you know 20, 2019 ish, um, Alameda was it was a primary liquidity provider, and it was I think probably the only backstop liquidity provider um, at the beginning. There there were a bunch by the end, but but not not at the beginning, which meant that um, it was important for Alameda to be able to absorb liquidations. Um, you know, if they were to happen and that um, if it ran out of margin on the platform to be able to do so, um, that would be, uh, you know, creating substantial risk on the platform. Now, obviously, over time, that changed, you know, over time, uh, uh, Alameda became a much smaller fraction of the liquidity in general on the platform. And so that practice should have changed as well. I'm sure. not sure that it did. When, um, when, but when, what would you say was the exact point at which you had zero visibility into Alameda? I don't think I ever had literally zero visibility into Alameda. I think I always had at least a little bit. Um, but I think that the point at which that became a like fairly small amount of visibility so you um, had some visibility, but not enough to know that they were, you know, levered up by the billions on FTX. So I know that I'd like periodically see, you know, some high level financial information from Alameda. I don't think it generally broke out like position by exchange or anything like that. Um, and I also saw like PL graphs from Alameda periodically, you know, like here's over the last six months, you know, what are you know, what our, our, you know, profit or, or lack thereof has, has, has been. Um, but that, that was again, displaying something, you know, very different. I, I don't remember, you know, 
so, so there was some information, you know, that I like as a large shareholder would, you know, request so and get periodically. You, what but, information was uh, made available to you? I the information I remember being made available to me primarily were those two things: were you know high level aggregate balance sheets and uh, and and you know P and L graphs over time. So you saw the balance sheet being heavily concentrated in FTT and that didn't raise any red flags. I'm not sure that I even saw it broken out by token. Like I think high level means like, you know, assets and liabilities and like retained income and things like that. Got it. So um, looking towards the next few weeks, what are you anticipating to unfold? Who's reaching out to you? Who are you talking to? It sounds like you don't have legal counsel. Um, maybe we can start with your, your, you know, family super important. What advice is your father? Uh, maybe are the, is he, uh, supporting you in sort of doing a lot of these interviews? So, uh, I do have some legal counsel though. I have, I have, uh, you know, change legal counsel at various points. I, I have, um, you know, some who I, I've kept the whole time. I have, you know, some who have joined, um, there are a number I've talked to in aggregate, uh, in general, like almost all of the counsel that I talked to, I think had a, an immediate negative reaction to the idea of me doing interviews. That was not a popular idea. And I think that the, you know, the general sort of you know, my general read of that was. It sounds um, like they prepped you well enough because you keep using not to my knowledge. Yeah, I know, right? That's uh, that's what they said. They said just just go up there and when you're asked your name, just say not to my knowledge. Um, yeah, no, I um, do not recall. That's right. Uh, so I think there might be a Benjamin in there somewhere, but I'm not totally sure. Um, uh, so, I. Uh, yeah, people weren't very hot on the idea. Um. And I think part of that is that's just the playbook advice. Don't say anything. Um, I think part of it is I think there, I think at least some of them are just optimizing for something different than what I am. Um, and like I'm not optimizing for like you know minimizing I like um, I. Like, like, I, I, I'm not trying to to slink into a, a hole here. Like, I, I think I have a duty to do what's to do everything I can, even if that's not very much. Um, to try to do what I, I can for 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 customers as as much as is possible. And you know, one thing I think that means is saying what I know is trying to to communicate to them. Um, and, and I think that's true of customers. I think that's true of the public more generally. Um, and so I think that that's probably a piece of it as well. Um, and I, I, and I don't know, it just, it didn't feel like the right or productive thing to do for me to not say anything. And obviously I'm, I, I don't know as much as I should know, as much as I really wish I didn't have access to a lot of data right now. Um, but there still are some things I know there's, there still is some that I can say and, I want to be helpful where I, where I can there. And I want to be helpful to, you know, all the teams that are working on this. Are and, you aware, are yeah. you aware of any potential criminal charges directed towards you? I, uh, um, obviously I've heard a lot of chatter right online. I've heard a lot of people speculating about it. I've seen, um, but, I. Uh, you know, I don't know where that's going to end up. Um, and um, it's you not what I've you been. You mentioned in your interview with George Stephanopoulos that you're not Bernie Madoff and that there's a real yep. business here. Um, it's it's yep. interesting to me uh, in as much as while Bernie Madoff was clearly, and, and in hindsight, we have the evidence that it was definitively a Ponzi scheme. One thing that was so interesting about that entity or enterprise, if you can call it that, is that the books were almost meticulously kept. And so yeah. while the investments were maybe fake, at least the, there were controls that allowed him 
to see what was going on. And yes. he seemed, but, but it sounds like you, you said during the interview, you weren't very familiar with Bernie Madoff. I mean, I don't know the details of what happened there. I haven't done a deep dive into it. But I guess the point I'm making is, it, I guess someone who maybe is a bit more cynical could say you're taking the alternate approach of, I had no idea what was going on and it was just a mess, but there was trading happening. I had embarrassingly little knowledge about what was going on. Um, I had like, uh, I was, um, there were a lot of things that I, I had to look up um, when, when things started going south, um, you know, I, at uh, the beginning of uh, of November that I don't think I should have had to look up that I, that I think should have been things that I was, uh, you know, intimately aware of. Um, but I, uh, I, uh, it was, um, yeah, there, there are a lot of failures of oversight on many dimensions there. Um, but I do think like FTX was a real, it was a real business that was making real profit. And yeah, so was Alameda a real business? Alameda was a real business that was making real profit as so well. Was, it, how, how many was it profitable last year? Uh, last year, meaning 2021? Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. I, I think. You uh, I don't remember the exact. You, you, were, you were the CEO in 2021. I stepped down formally uh, in 2021, uh, but I also had not been effectively running it for a while. Um, I think it made i uh, i uh, my memory is it made you know something like a billion dollars i think um of you know arbitrage profit in 2021 um and uh, uh i think it i uh, so yeah i think i think is is quite profitable in 2021 by most metrics um and uh, uh i think it, it also in 2021 i think on top of that kind of like you know, large, like liquid profit that made also, I think had, you know, quite large mark to market profits of how less liquid it, positions. How much did it make in 2019? 2019, I want to say it made a few hundred million, maybe something like that. It's been, it's been a while, but that that's my ballpark recollection. Hmm. Um, so, I think, it, oh, go for it. So that was a real, that was a real business in terms of Profitability. Yeah, it was, could, in your estimation, could Alameda have been a success without FTX existing? Yeah, it was a success before FTX existed, and um, I and it was, I you know, it was not. I don't think really making money on FTX. Um, no, and it was, it was hemorrhaging money. Wasn't that right. The case? I I think that that's that's probably closer to the truth. Um, I I don't think that FTX helped. Alameda as a business, particularly in, you know, trying to make money, like it's doing arbitrage on other venues primarily, um, which did, obviously did, did, did Trabuco when he left, did he like indicate the extent to which the business might be in trouble? And that's why he was leaving. Like, I'm like, he had to have said something. I mean, my memory when he was leaving, he, it, it was for personal reasons. Like he, he wanted you know, he personally didn't time want to explore to, things. He personally didn't want to work at a firm that was hemorrhaging money. I uh, <laughs> that certainly isn't what he said to me. Um, but but also, you, I uh, well, I uh, there are definitional issues here. By certainly, if you looked at like you know graphs of like trading P and L, those never got to the point well, where well, they were well, hemorrhaging what did Sam, money. What did Sam exactly say to you? I, uh, I mean, basically, I think wanted to semi-retire, wanted to take time to himself to explore life that 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 was my you know high level understanding of it and that was it i mean you just let people quit in in a sort of one sentence two sentence uh, mm, there are a lot of other sort of personal details that are not mine to share but also have nothing to do with like alameda or its performance and um uh are just about what he wanted um but it was is amicable and um and I didn't and don't think it was related to Alameda or or um or risk or something like that. 
Um, I think it's just like what he wanted to do with his life. Do you, um, when you think about what maybe you can do next, let's say um, you go to jail for a certain period of time. What do you do after that? I have no idea. I, I'm not thinking that far ahead right now. And I, there's going to come a time when I'm going to have to think further ahead about my life. I, you know, right now I'm more, more just thinking locally what I can do, but I, I have no idea long-term what I'll end up, you know, doing. Do you think that sort of short-term thinking that you have right now played a role in the downfall of FTX and Alameda? I don't think so. I'm not entirely confident. I'm trying to introspect about what I think I screwed. What, 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 like what from sort of a higher level perspective, how I was thinking and acting poorly. And I think what at least feels right to me is closer to um, not like short versus long term, but I think sort of grounded versus I uh, versus like, if anything, I think that the if anything, I think it would be the opposite direction that like the long the, the, the thing that felt to me like longer term thinking was thinking about like long term business expansion opportunities was thinking about like what roles five years from now could FTX be playing in you know the global financial ecosystem and what at a high level should we be doing to steer towards that right now and i think that you know what felt to me more like shorter term thinking at the time was you know well let's look at all of ftx's statistics right now let's look at all the data um but i think that that second thing that that thinking on a more granular and specific and detailed level about exactly what everything what all the numbers are right now I is know, what I should have been doing much but the, more but the, of. But the point I'm making is that I, I, this is the, I, I feel like I've been fairly respectful and I haven't really like said I disagree yep. or, you know, I, I pushed back on you, but I don't think I've said like you're explicitly wrong. Yep. And this is where I like explicitly think you're wrong, which mm -hmm. is if you were spending more time looking at the financials, looking at the arrangement arrangements you had with Alameda, Instead of maybe, you know, purchasing the naming rights of the Miami Miami right. Heat Arena and gallivanting, as it were, and yep. and looking at how you yep. could, um, you know, get Super Bowl ads, yep. then maybe we would not be oh. in this situation. And it that's short term thinking. So I, I think like you're you're you sort of saying that you were not thinking in the short term versus the long term is, is a bit disingenuous. Oh, I, I see. Sorry. I think I agree with you. I think, and, and I agree with you that the things that I should have been doing would have been the things that were long-term important and that those would have been diving more into the details rather than thinking about branding. What I was saying was at the time, it felt to me like the things I were doing were the longer term. It, it felt in some sort of like, visceral way like the longer term thing was thinking about positioning the brand and the company over a five-year time period i i think you're right that that wasn't the brand actually long-term thinking as opposed to ensuring that the financial underpinnings were secure right and, and, and i think you're right that the thing you're pointing to was what actually was long-term thinking and the thing i was doing was not actually long-term thinking it felt like long-term thinking to me at the time um but but i think you're right that it wasn't actually long-term thinking fair enough um again like just thinking about the prospect of any sort of um you know if it, it certainly this campaign that you're on in a sense is it is it like is it just sort of i want to you know, fill up time? Is it part of some sort of long-term strategy to win over the court of opinion to, you know, um, uh, sort of underpin some sort of future 
uh, trial of some sort? Like, is there a strategy? Like after you get off this call, like, are you going to, um, debrief with, with your father or legal counsel? Like, how does this all fit into everything for you personally? Or is it just maybe a form of therapy? Um, it's, I think there's some piece of me just wanting to, to say my piece, but I, I think beyond that, like, to the extent there is a form of strategy here, it's, um, uh, I mean, what, what happened was really bad and I bear a lot of responsibility for Does that. Does your father and, agree with, agree with you doing this? Um, I think that like he and most of the people I talked to were not excited about the prospect of me doing it. I think, I think that in retrospect, um, I think they appreciate that at least it's helped maybe a little bit in, um, in getting my, you know, getting in information out there and, I don't want to say exactly my side of the story because I don't think my side of the story looks very good for me. Um, but uh, but even outside of all of the legitimate, really bad parts of it, there are a lot of kind of conspiracy theories that were floating around, and it makes sense that there would be in this context. Like in in the context of a shocking and fast crash and collapse. Uh, of something it it makes sense that that uh a lot of theories would start reverberating and i mean some of them are true um but some of them aren't and i you think that in the absence of me saying anything there is no way to tell fact from fiction from the outside there's no way for the public discourse to distinguish those and you know there were ways in which it was getting a little bit dissociated from what happened and there are ways in which it wasn't which it was just absolutely correct and and uh and 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 not a good look for me but um uh but but i do think that a piece of it was and, and you know you referenced this as well i think briefly i think i didn't get around to saying anything but but like the drug use piece like that's something which just doesn't i think reflect at all what was happening like we I don't party. I've never partied. I didn't drink till after I was 21. I have half a glass of cider a year. And, you know, I've been prescribed by, uh, by therapists, some medication over time to help with focus and concentration. It's not, um, you know, it doesn't like lead to like the sort of rash impulsiveness. I think people are talking about if anything, I think it, it points a little bit in the opposite direction. Um, but the, the one I, drug that was sort of, um, mentioned out there in the uh, Twitter mm -hmm. verse was used to treat Parkinson's. Can you say that that is not a drug that you use or? Well, it doesn't treat Parkinson's. The, the Twitter verse was a little bit not super thorough, I think, in how they looked it up. Um, one of the compounds in it in other forms has in some cases been prescribed for Parkinson's, but the actual medication that I have taken, um, I don't think it's ever prescribed for Parkinson's. It's not on label for Parkinson's. It's not in the description of it that it's used to treat Parkinson's. That was, I think, a little bit of a, like, I think if you Google it and you're not, I think it'll pull up some results no, no, sometimes. No, no one, no one, I was talking about this with someone uh, yesterday, crypto. Yeah. We, we, we like to go through these cycles where we're a genealogist and then we're a geo, uh, you know, political expert. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, the, uh, I think it's MSAM, but yes, it, is it MSAM? It is MSAM. It's an antidepressant. I uh, and... MSAM is only ever used as that. The selegiline, which is one of the compounds in it, in other forms, is sometimes used for Parkinson's. MSAM isn't. Um, Understood. And so, yeah. And is shaking a sort of symptom of that, or of uh, of usage of MSAM? the drug? Uh, I think that's more just ADD. I, I think like. I just always have to be fiddling with something. And if I, it's not that I have like involuntary shaking or anything like that. It's that I need to fiddle with something. And if I don't have something for my hands to fiddle with, um, then I'll 
you know, just sort of sometimes absentmindedly like uh, bounce my leg up and down uh, as a substitution for that. But but I generally don't if I have something tactile for my hands. It's one of the reasons that I'll often have some level of low, sort of low level underlying multitasking of some sort just to keep myself quieter and, and to keep myself being able to focus and to sort of, you know, shunt off excess energy um, and excess um, a- activation. So, um, but yeah, no, that's that's not like a result of, you know, meds or anything. I think it's just ADD. Why do you think you haven't talked about this more publicly? So I actually drafted up a tweet thread on it and then didn't end up sending it. Um, but it's something that I, I think over time I've talked about in slightly more public forums. It's something I talk about sometimes, um, with the company. Um, it's something pretty personal to me and as much as I've been out there over the last few years on the PR side, I haven't personally been like the thing that's been out there has been branding. Um, and it's been me as a spokesperson for FTX, not me as a person, not me as like, you know, a, a set of, you know, feelings or desires or emotions or anything like that. And it's because I didn't think there was any, need for that to be and i i frankly feel a little bit nervous and embarrassed with well you you definitely my... felt like some you know form of wanting to present yourself in a certain way yeah which i think speaks to some of the revelations in that verge article where you said you have you you effectively uh, as a person in your position uh maybe you need to suppress um some of these um, yeah. uh, difficulties with, with ADD and, and, and the like, but also you have to present yourself as woke. Um, yeah. do you actually care about anything politically? I do. I do care about some things quite a bit. I don't care about not everything. No, no, I don't. And I think the way that I see it, there's like, there's a huge distinction between like, the issues which are most important for the world, the issues that will determine what happens with the world on the one hand, and a lot of things that I think have basically no impact on the world that no one, that 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 don't, don't change billions of people's lives, that, that don't change the course of history, um, but that are, they're just sort of, um, I, you know, I, ways for people to express partisan affiliation. There are ways for people to have excuses to get mad at each other and to draw a distinction between themselves and others. And I think those are dumb. And I think that like politics is a messy combination of those two things. And I think some of what happened in politics is unbelievably important for the future of the world. And some of it is unbelievably dumb. And, uh, and, 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 you know, to what I said, like, but but that interview, I mean that, or that back and forth, which I I think you did not anticipate to be made public it kind of raises a broader question, which is how can we believe anything that this man says or says he believes in? I mean, at the end of the day, like that's a decision for you to make. Like I can't decide what you believe, but all I can say is for most of my life, I've had a goal of trying to do what I can to dedicate my life to doing as much net good for the world as I can. And obviously. Why? Why? What made you feel that this was something that you were meant to do? Most people just want to get by and, you know, do what they can for those close to them. Why did you, as Sam Bankman Freed, think that you were uniquely positioned to do net good for the world? So, I mean, part of it was that I felt like I was in a position where I had a shot at doing it, where I had... In what respect? I 
there are things that I was good at that I was, you know, able to, um, uh, you know, I, I had, it seemed like the capacity to be able to make and donate a lot of money. And that would potentially have the ability to have a lot of impact on the world. And, and so that, that was a part of it, but that, it. that that's and, not And you almost really... got there, right? Like you had, yeah. you were yeah. able to, and we disagreed about the source of the Robin hood buy why buy a stake in Robin hood at 7% instead of, you know, buy housing for the poor or something else. I thought it was a good investment. And I thought that, you know, if I made that investment, it would pay off. And then that would mean more money to be able to donate. But, but I think you can understand how a lot of people would listen to this and think, well, you already, you, you got there. You went from being nothing to in two years being, you know, in the top, you know, couple dozen of wealthy folks who make way more. I mean, even someone like, you know, Ken Griffin, right. Has probably done way more charity work and is worth half as much as you. What, what, what did you do charity wise? I mean, you could have done it, but you were, you know, buying other crypto companies instead. I gave hundreds of millions of dollars to charity in the last year. Um, I gave, I mean, I did not have much liquid net worth. Um, now maybe of negative liquid net worth. I didn't have time for, What was you know, the biggest charity donation you made in dollar terms and to whom? I don't know what the single biggest one was, but I think the biggest pot was pandemic prevention. Um, I think mm -hmm. that was, I think the biggest pots were, were that, were, um, uh, a lot of community work. There was some global warming um, uh, prevention donations. There was uh, some animal welfare. There's some global health and development. I think pandemic prevention was the single biggest pot, though. Um, and, but and and that was that was has been signed. They've they've got the money. Are they a creditor to the uh, empire, as it were? I mean, some of those went through. Um, others were multi-year grants, and I don't feel good about the prospects of those multi-year grants and i feel really bad like about that because as as i'm guessing you're pointing out like that undermines the whole well, reason well, what i did I'm any of this point in the out first is that place. very little has actually gotten to any charity oh i think hundreds of millions have gotten to charities okay hundreds of millions but I think that's right. Sort of the, you know, full 25 or some odd billion. Well, but that wasn't 25 just billion. As much, just as much charity went to uh, property in the Bahamas. I think we can sort of equivocate there. Well, that was my charity versus all property in the Bahamas for all FTX employees combined, right? Yeah, like, I'm just saying that, that the figure is equal. I'm just... I think that's I think that's right. I think I think my charitable donations were roughly equal to all of the property uh for all of the employees of the company. And you know, and those were that was property for meant for many years and that was charitable donations for fifteen months or something like that. Yeah. Um but I, uh, but that's the whole point of this in the first place. And I was, you know, really looking to try and ramp that up over over time and you know, ended up sure. doing more than I thought I would um, this year. Part of this, part of this whole story is right. CZ. Um, yep. You know, you went to, uh, do you think that was a sincere offer? What no. did that look like behind the scenes now? No, I don't think it was one. Um, I, I, I mean, especially in retrospect, but, but even a little bit at the time, um, I, uh, I mean, the fact that like, the fact that there was like, some of the pieces of how that negotiation went, um, there's very little attention to detail. Um, in a way, I would have expected substantially more attention to detail. Um, uh, there were various, I mean, we heard that it wasn't happening on Twitter. We weren't told that directly, and it was first, I think, leaked out to the press with multiple 
unrelated reasons given at various points in the time in time to media um and which were in turn different than what we were eventually told um i uh, and that's you know my I, I i don't know for sure i can't you know i can't ascribe attentions intentions to, to other people but i don't i don't currently believe that that it was ever that that was ever intended to go through when was the last time you two have spoken uh shortly after that To be a fly on that wall would be quite interesting. Um, yep. Well, Sam, I think that um, we've kind of dug into most of the topics that there really are to dig into. Um, potentially, we we may speak again. Um, yep. But I know that we're we're reaching the sort of end of the hour, so we'll we'll let you go. Um, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I, and of course, any, you know, anything that I can do to, uh, help at least, at least give people a sense of where things are as best I can. 